One of the more persistent economic canards from the days of Adam Smith on has been the idea that labour is at a quote-unquote disadvantage to capital. Let's pretend we have a supply of labour. Here they are, all standing in a line waiting to get jobs. The guys at the front will work for $10, the guys in the middle for $9, and the guys at the back for $8. Along comes Henry Ford, who has opened a car factory. Now... Assuming that all these jobs are entirely unskilled and things like knowledge and experience are not a factor, which of course in the real world they always would be, all other things being equal, Mr. Ford is going to start hiring from the back of this line. He'll take all the workers at $8 first because, well, why wouldn't he? It's like going to a shop and the shopkeeper saying, would you like this Mars bar for $1, $2 or $3? Unless you have some pathological urge to give shopkeepers money for nothing, you'll choose the cheaper option. Now, let's assume another scenario. Here, Mr. Ford already has workers on $10, but looking at the line of potential workers outside, he sees he could replace them for the workers on $8. So he announces that the new rate of pay will be $8, and anyone who doesn't like this new wage can get out. The workers on $10 are furious at this and organize a strike. Now, under total free market conditions, Mr. Ford would simply just fire the troublemakers and replace them with the $8 workers. But of course, in the real world, the state usually intervenes here and forces the company to pay whatever rate is negotiated with the union. Without state intervention, attempts by unions to increase wages mostly fail. In the 19th century, employers also had a range of options to hit back at striking workers without firing them through the use of things like lockouts, which have been making something of a comeback more recently. This is where the employer literally locks out the striking employees. Anyway, let's say in our scenario, the $10 workers get their way and keep their jobs at the old rate. Naturally, this means the other guys on the line don't get a job. Why can't you give my dad a job? Because he's not in the union, kid. But of course, it's not only the marginal workers who are pushed out in this agreement. Also, customers must pay through higher prices and ultimately the employer may also suffer through lower sales and therefore lower revenue, which in the long run means fewer jobs. As W. H. Hutt put it in 1930, the trade union gains at the expense of excluded workers, capital and the consumer. A month or so down the road and Mr. Ford might well think about investing in capital. That's the automation you read so much about in the news, which is a substitute for labour. The marginal productivity of capital may be more than labour when wages are above the market rate. Down the road again, the time savings made by these capital investments might reduce the need for labour further. And then the very $10 job which our man protested for in the strike is lost forever. 75 years later and, well, we know what happened, don't we? Of course, in the real world, there is never simply one employer. Thus far, we've treated Mr. Ford as a monopoly employer, but in reality, he had competitors, Mr. General Motors and Mr. Chrysler, for example. In effect, each of these car manufacturers were saying to the potential labor force, work for me. If competition for labor is fierce enough, then we may start to see the wage of the marginal worker, that's the guy right at the back of the line there, bid up. If that marginal worker represents an above zero increase in productivity, then the capitalist will compete with his rivals to secure that worker for himself. Of course, the ultimate employer of any labor is not the capitalist, but the consumers who are keeping that capitalist in business. It is their purchase of consumer goods which ultimately dictate the demand for labor in any given industry. 
the more people who want cars, the more car manufacturers enter the market, the more jobs there will be, and the more employers will compete with each other for staff, which helps bid up wages. As we've seen, strike action and artificial controls will tend towards reducing the total demand for labor. It will reduce the availability of the total number of jobs for the short-term benefit of the strikers, but to the long-term benefit of no one. So all this is well and good, but what if the employers get together and form a cartel to fix the price of labor to be artificially low? Let's say Mr. Ford, Mr. General Motors and Mr. Chrysler agree that they will pay workers no more than $8. Well, in the real world, no industry exists in a vacuum and the cartel will face outside competition, let's say from the meat industry, for the same marginal worker. Now our $8 worker has an opportunity to jump from making cars to chopping meat for more money. If enough workers do this, then the cartel will face a shortage of workers and in time the cartel will be forced to raise that bottom wage up to make the job more attractive. One sector that was notorious for work shortages in the 19th and early 20th centuries were farmers. Every season they complained about labor shortages and every season they refused to increase wages for their workers. Year after year they lost workers to towns and cities and year after year out of a mixture of stubbornness and sheer stupidity they would not increase their wages. For whatever reason the rural folk have always been incredibly resistant to making the necessary wage adjustments and capital investments to stay in competition. And they've been like this going back at least to the early 1800s. If you ever wonder why there's such a long history of government subsidies for farmers, it's all there. Anyway, another objection to what I've said might be something along the lines of, what about the fact that workers face starvation if they do not work while their employers do not? In other words, if Joe doesn't go to work this week, he's going to starve, whereas Mr. Henry Ford, as a frat cat, is going to be alright. Well, is that true? Mr. Ford has rents to pay, contracts to keep, debts, outstanding liabilities of all sorts, maintenance and repairs to take care of. His output with zero workers is zero. Just a single day of the factory being closed cost him maybe millions. A whole week and he may very well go bust. So, it is simply not the case that labour is at disadvantage to capital, because without labour, there is no capital, just as without capital, there is no labour. It is a relationship of mutual benefit, a positive sum game, trade by definition. Ah, you might say, what about the fact that some workers have no savings? Mr Ford let's say can last at least a week because he has some money in the bank but what about the man who has nothing well first is it really true that a worker with savings would be paid any more or less than a worker with none i mean to the employer this fact is completely immaterial he's going to employ the worker at whatever the going rate happens to be taking knowledge experience productivity and so on into account or other things being equal the fact that one man has savings and the other man does not is neither here nor there however from the point of view of the individual worker, the savings may be a consideration. The chap on the left here with $2,000 in the bank might be able to hold out from accepting a job offer for longer. Or in some conditions, he might accept lower pay because he can afford it in the short term. But really, as W. H. Hutt concludes in that book I mentioned from 1930, we cannot make any meaningful generalizations about this because it'll be up to the individuals in question. Answering the claim that the chap with savings enjoys an advantage over the chap with none because he has greater mobility, in short, that is because he can afford a bus fare to some other place, Hutt says, we can make no useful generalizations on this matter at all because it might be argued with equal justification that the worker without savings has an advantage over the worker with savings because he has nothing to lose. Perhaps, for example, he will be more willing to take risks 
maybe he'll work down on mine and the guy on the left won't. This is one of those things where the variables are too great to make any hard and fast rule. You're in the realm of psychology there, not economics. Finally, what about the minimum wage? Doesn't this sort all of this out? Well, not really. In the allocation of scarce resources which have alternative uses, all it does is fix the bottom rate, pushes the bottom rung of workers out as well as those who might expect more. More problematically, if you remember the car industry cartel from earlier, what this has done is effectively put them unwittingly in league with the meat industry who now have their wages fixed at the same rate. The old bargaining power that the marginal worker had between industries is eliminated because wherever he turns now, it's $9. There's no incentive for industries to compete over the marginal worker because their rate is set by fiat, which means, in a paradoxical way, the minimum wage worker today likely has fewer opportunities to bargain with employers than they did in the past. As is so often the case, what is flagged to us as progress is actually a regression. Now get out.